The following are shocking statistics on the rising cost of health care in the United States. Prepare to cry. When you're looking at these statistics, keep in mind that despite having some of the best health care professionals in the world and easily ranking number one in spending and having the most access to pharmaceutical treatments, we actually don't do great in terms of health care outcomes. Of course, there are other reasons for this like diet and lifestyle, but we rank number 37th in life expectancy and relatively high in preventable hospitalizations and deaths and disability rate. And we really should do much better. Now, cost in the United States for health insurance wasn't always so large. In 1970, we spent $74 billion on health care, only $353 per capita. In 2019, it had skyrocketed to $3.8 trillion, over $11,000 per capita. Even taking the 1970 figure in modern dollars, it was only $1,800 per capita, a pretty reasonable figure if you ask me. Now, of course, the economy has also grown, but in 1970, we spent only about 7% of our GDP on health care, but it was 17.7% in 2019, which dwarfs other comparable countries. Just a few select examples. This is percentage of GDP on health care, according to the World Bank, the U.S. 17.7%, England 10%, Singapore only 4.5%, renowned for their health care outcomes, Switzerland 12%, Norway 10%. And it's naive to believe this doesn't affect you just because you have health insurance. Take a look at this study by Kaiser Family Foundation on workers' wages and health insurance costs. Overall inflation between 2010 and 2020 was 19%. Workers' wages increased 27%, but family premiums increased 55% and deductibles increased 111%. And even if your health insurance did cover everything, the efficient market theory says that your total compensation should be similar to your market value. So really, you're paying for health insurance out of your salary, even if your employer covers it. But are we getting more for the extra money? Unfortunately, no. We're essentially just paying more for the same services. Consider the cost of childbirth in different countries, for example. The average cost of a C-section in 2017 in the United States was $15,000. Compare that to $8,400 in Australia, $7,500 in Switzerland, $7,100 in the United Kingdom, and $5,300 in the Netherlands. And we don't really have better infant mortality rates to justify this extra cost, we're just paying more. Subspecialty drugs are also outrageously more expensive in the United States. Consider this drug Avonex for multiple sclerosis, FDA approved in 1996, not even that effective, and yet it is $1,700 for a single dose in the United States. This is a once weekly injection, so multiply by 50, and that's the annual cost over $80,000 a year. Compared that to other countries, $222 in the United Kingdom, $260 in Switzerland, completely ridiculous, and this leads to higher copays and many people with MS not being able to afford their medication and sometimes developing permanent neurological disabilities as a result. Now to the big picture consequences, debt and bankruptcy. Based on surveys, 60% of Americans who file for bankruptcy cite significant medical bills or income loss due to illness as the primary reason for bankruptcy, and 43 million Americans have overdue medical debt on their credit report, and 14% of households with zero or negative net worth, which is a lot of Americans, have significant medical debt. And this primarily affects people who are most disenfranchised, as medical debt is most common in people who are poor, without health insurance, disabled, or African American. These costs have profound effects on people's psychology and decision-making. This is data from the Kaiser Family Foundation. For example, 38% said they were very worried about unexpected medical bills, and this was more than any other routine expense. For instance, only 22% were very worried about paying their rent or mortgage. Only 62% of Americans are at least somewhat confident in their ability to afford health care. And in 2019, total U.S. out-of-pocket spending, out-of-pocket, not through insurance, was $406 billion. And it's a myth that people who have insurance are immune to this phenomenon because 44% of people with privately purchased plans still avoid care to save money. This is things like vaccinations, screenings, and routine treatments to save money on the cost of health care. 61% plan to delay retirement or work during retirement just to pay for medical coverage. 28.9 million
million, or 10.9% of non-elderly Americans lacked health insurance in 2019. So if you think the Affordable Care Act eliminated the non-insured problem, you're incorrect. It reduced it. It did not eliminate it. For the elderly, because of Medicare, being uninsured is rare. Less than 1% of Americans over age 65 are uninsured. And 73.7% of people without coverage cite high cost as the main barrier to getting health insurance. Obviously, if you could afford it, you want health insurance. And more consequences. Due to medical costs, 9% take on substantial debt, 8% borrow from family or friends, 7% use their retirement savings, 6% get a second job, 5% sell off personal belongings, 3% tap into home equity, and another 3% seek debt consolidation or simply declare bankruptcy. In a very disturbing trend, hospitals, instead of negotiating with patients who can't afford to pay, are simply suing them and garnishing their wages, and these are often insured middle-class individuals. This is documented in the book The Price We Pay by Dr. Marty McCarry. 37% of U.S. hospitals sue patients who cannot afford their bills. One such hospital over a five-year period, Mary Washington Hospital, filed 24,200 such lawsuits. That's 13 per day. If you look at debt collection overall, 58% is for unpaid medical bills, and around half of women with metastatic breast cancer are harassed by collection agencies over medical bills. Often medical billing can be very confusing with unclear pricing and it could be a bit dubious but sometimes it just crosses the line entirely this is an actual medical bill of a woman who had a c-section delivery and you can see the itemized charges and the total cost of around thirteen thousand dollars and some payments from insurance and a balance of sixteen hundred dollars but if you look at the individual items they're charging her for skin to skin contact after a c-section this is where they put the baby on the woman's stomach and chest for bonding and sometimes breast breastfeeding, and they charge her $40 literally to hold her own baby. This is not a medical treatment. You can't bill for this. This is outright fraud. Now, I'm talking a lot about how this affects the little guy, but it affects the big guys too. It's not so easy to be an employer in 2021 and provide health insurance to your employees. It's been estimated that health insurance benefits cost on average $2.65 per hour worked by an employee. So for businesses that employ a lot of entry levels employees who don't make that much money, this is a very significant cost. Although some businesses do quite well and they can easily absorb it, the average business profit margin is only around 5%. So it's not so easy and they can only pay so much for health insurance. And as a result, of course, it now affects the individual as 27% of the premiums for family coverage are now paid by the employee. And less and less employers provide health insurance. The percentage of employees employees offering health benefits declined from 68% in 2000 to 53% in 2017, and we're headed to a time where small businesses simply don't offer health benefits at all. Massive corporations, pension funds, state budgets are feeling the pain too. Some examples, Chrysler, GM, Delphi, Avaya, all went bankrupt largely due to the massive cost of health insurance benefits for their retirees. 93% of government Government promised retiree health benefits are unfunded liabilities, meaning funded by future taxpayers. Individual states are having to make major changes. In North Carolina, retirees hired after 2020 don't get medical benefits. In Kansas, there's no health care subsidy if you don't qualify for Medicare. And Ohio teachers no longer get Medicare Part B reimbursement. And I guarantee you there's a restriction or austerity measure coming to a state near you soon. Now, if you don't believe these statistics, and they are shocking, I can provide a citation on every single one. Just ask in the comments below. So how do we solve this problem from the big picture perspective? How do we provide good, ideally universal care at reasonable costs that's sustainable for generations? Who has the best system? Should we make a major change? I'd be interested to know your experiences. If you're an American and you have a story about health care costs, or if you live in a different country, what are your health care experiences and what do you think about American healthcare and does anyone have any big picture solutions what kind of changes to healthcare policy should we make now of course i have my own ideas which i will save for a future video